Paula for sharing with us what God is doing through your life as you continue to support missions. We have missions all over the world. And one of the beautiful things about our missionaries is you get to meet them. They're independent missionaries. We support them. And uh, they trust individuals and churches to keep them on the mission field. And you make a tremendous difference in this world. And many of them, as they come through, they will come and share with us and get to know you as their personal friends. And so I pray you'll always be thinking about what can we do to share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. And maybe how can God use you? And you may be on one of those mission teams, whether it's a construction team or doing backyard Bible studies, doing medical and dental teams, whatever it is, God may open that door and give you an opportunity. I pray you'll be ready to walk through that. Our message today is spiritual benefits. And so what we're going to do today is look at what does it mean to be a child of God and what comes along with being a child of God kind of helps us define what our purpose is in life. And then Ray's going to preach the last Sunday of this coming month, uh, which I think will be the 25th. And then I'll come back on the first Sunday of August and I'll share with you uh, what is it that is our purpose today and what is a plan to fulfill that purpose on August the 4th. And so that's where we'll be going. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 12. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. And what Paul is doing, uh, Paul is speaking to the church at Philippi, very special group of people to him. Uh, Philippi is named after Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. And so Alexander the Great was taught by his father, anything you believe that you can do, if you'll put your mind to it, you can accomplish things the world cannot understand. And so Alexander the Great, with the teaching from his father, Philip of Macedon, conquered the whole world. And in the book of Philippians, one of my favorite scriptures, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, says, let this mind be in you. The Greeks were big about the mind, controlling life and controlling what you were going to do and what you were going to accomplish. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if the mind of Christ is in you, if he's in your heart, then there's so many things that could be done. So Paul is talking to the Philippian church. It's called the letter of joy. And uh, Philippi would become a Roman colony after the Romans conquered the world and took over from the Greeks. And many of the Roman soldiers and magistrates would stay in Philippi in Greece. And so here he's teaching them about what, what is it that's important in your life. And so Paul is speaking of his own life and saying, hey, a lot of us live for our credentials and our character and our achievements and who we are and what we accomplish. And Paul is saying, I I'm about to reprioritize and restructure what's important to me in life. And so he's talking with these people who are bragging about who they are. And he said, now, if you wanted to brag, I could probably brag with you, but that really doesn't mean anything. And so he's about to exchange things that are not important and put on his list of what is important, and those are the spiritual benefits we're going to speak of today. Tony and Julie, I see you sitting over here. This is people that I married day. Jimmy and Carly here, and here is Tony and Julie. And Julie, I don't know if you remember this. When you got saved, you told everybody about Jesus. And I understand you have two little boys right now. Tony played football, and uh, that's why he's so big. His dad, Mark, is with him. But I just looked over here and spotted you guys. And I remember telling Julie one time, she was in my office, she was bringing every friend she had at North Forest High School, and she's telling them about Jesus. And I was telling Julie, slow down just a little bit. You know, she was telling them, listen, you need Jesus in your life, or you're going to go to hell without Jesus in your life. And I was trying to say, wait, wait, just a minute. Let's love on them a little bit before we send them to hell. And so God is in the business of changing people's lives. So this is people I married long ago day. Now, what does God want to say as a spiritual benefits in your life? Read with me if you would, and let's catch in kind of the middle of Paul's dialogue where he's saying, if you wanted to brag about credentials and achievements, I could stay in there with you, but flesh profits us nothing. It's the spiritual life that makes a difference. And so he says this, and I'm going to back up just a little bit and see if I can find a word uh, where he talks about in verse 5. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. Pharisees were the most strict keepers of the law. And, and here Paul was one of those Pharisees. So he says, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. If being a legalistic person and say, I'm going to keep the law is going to get you to heaven, he said, I'd be in heaven, but it wouldn't do it. 
And so now he does a transition, pivotal verse about what's important in his life, and it's not all the things of the past, which was the keeping of the Judea law. He says this in verse 7. Here's the transition. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider it or count it a loss. This is an accounting term. What's, what's your assets? What's your liabilities? And Paul is fixing to switch his assets and liabilities. He says, I consider it loss for the sake of who? Of Christ. What is more, I count or I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else in the world that you're pursuing will not bring you what you're looking for in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he said, here is a surpassing greatness of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, for whose sake I have lost all these things that are not important to me. I consider them rubbish or garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, and it is by faith. Verse 10, and you want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sharing in the sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, when he says somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead, talking about eternal life, he, he's not expressing doubt or uncertainty. He's expressing humility in his heart that God would choose to share his grace with him. Somehow this happened to me. God's going to take me to heaven. And I'm one of his children. And I want to know him. And I want to be my righteousness is in him and not my righteousness. And I want to fellowship with him even through the tough times and the blessed times of life. And so he says on in verse 12, not that I have already obtained, or verse 11, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect. Remember what I told you last week? We're not perfect. I hate to tell you that. We're not there yet. We're a work in progress. And it's by the grace and the mercy of God that we accomplish the things we accomplish. And we, we make mistakes. And, uh, and last night, Ed, Ed was, uh, his replacement leading the music was Neil Pope, school teacher for 44 and a half years. And Neil Poe is up here and he said, listen, we want to just, I'm here leading the music and we just want to pray for Brother Ray and the mission team coming in from Guatemala tonight. Now, Neil Poe is a history teacher. Every time I mention history, I see him sitting down here on the front row and there's another history teacher from Pella right there and probably a bunch of more. And I see him sitting down here and I'll be talking about things in history and he'll be doing this. And he waits till all of y'all leave. He said, now Cliff, uh, let me share something with you. He is so nice. Last night when he says, we're waiting for Brother Ray and the mission team to come back, and everybody was sitting here laughing because Brother Ed was with the mission team, not Brother Ray. And so when I got up, I went like this. <laughs> Your one mistake of 2021, let me highlight this for you. And so here he says, hey, we're not perfect. We haven't arrived yet, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. And why is he taking hold of me? Because he wants to share the spiritual blessings and the benefits that belong to you as a child of God. And so the first one he comes to, and we'll look at these in verses 8, 9, and 10. The first one he comes to is knowing Christ. And so he says, I, I want to know the surpassing greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I would trade everything just for having that personal relationship with him. And so what does it mean for you to know the Lord Jesus Christ? And what we're going to find out is knowledge is something that uh, is, is, is the world pursues. And this word knowledge in the Greek language is a word that's called gnosis. And this is what it means. It means knowledge that is gained in your life. And the way that it is gained in your life is through personal experience and intimate companionship. And so for those of you who are mechanics today, when you started out in the mechanic business, you, you learned a lot of stuff. Therefore, you know a lot of stuff, and you've gained it through experience. I, I was talking to a tax person this week who is a sweet lady who used to go to church here and works with a, with a firm up in Laurel. And I was saying, I'm proud of you and what God has done in your life. You're a CPA, and you're a tax expert. And she was saying, Brother Cliff, can I tell you something? When I graduated with my accounting degree, and then I passed my CPA, I, I really didn't know a lot. It was through working in this field 
that I have gained my experience. Well, that's what Paul says. I want to gain the experience of walking with the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. And we usually get to know people in different ways. And one of them is uh, what we use, we call it in America, historically. And you say, what is historical knowledge? Well, we know that George Washington was the first president of the United States. And some of you I know were as old as he is, but I'm not. And so I don't know him personally, but I know him historically. And, and so we have historical knowledge. And then we have what we call contemporaneously. We know people that way. That's people that live in the same lifespan that you're living in. And so you say, who are these people? Well, you know them from a distance. You don't know them real well, but uh, say Queen Elizabeth. I remember when my wife and I told you about going to a, a place called Danby Whisk, where the Lazenbys came from in northern England. Uh, right below Scotland and over on the border of Wales where they come together in the northern part above York in England. And I remember going there and I remember pursuing some of our relatives and looking at some of the houses over there, one of them named Lazenby Hall and Lazenby Cottage. And so uh, I, I saw this lady that invited us to her house. She was bringing flowers to the church we were visiting, Danby Whist Church. And so we go into her house, and she's sitting there saying, I've got a book I want you to see, and it's got the name of your family all in this book, and it's been out of print for years. But she loaned us that book, and we were able to photocopy that book and bring it home, and my aunt, who just lost her husband, Uncle Neil, in Purvis, uh, she's already sent me two messages. I need that information. She's a genealogist. And so this is contemporaneous. So when I look on the wall of that kitchen, there is that dairy farmer and his wife, Angie Gaubert, and they're standing there with who? Queen Elizabeth. Now, you say, Brother Cliff, do you know Queen Elizabeth? No, but I've seen her picture. I've seen her picture in somebody's, uh, you know, kitchen there. And so that's knowing somebody from a distance contemporaneously. You know Philip and Kate. You know Harry and Meghan. And they are on the media all the time. So you know them from a distance, but you really don't know them. And then you know people contactually. This is knowledge that you say, I, uh, contactually, I have contact with these people. These would be your neighbors that you speak to, or hopefully you do. Some of you don't, but you need to. And then this would be your bank tellers. You go in the bank, and, or maybe you go in the drugstore. You maybe go in the grocery store, and this is a person that you meet over and over. And you have contact with them, but it's more like a surface relationship. It's not that deep. And so you're just kind of going through the motions. Hey, how you doing? Hope you have a good day. And really, you don't mean it. You're just saying, hey, check me out. I need to get out of here and get on with my business. So all of these ways can be knowledge. But here, Paul speaks of a knowledge that goes far deeper. I want to gain knowledge knowing Christ in the surpassing greatness of his glory. And I want to do it through a daily experience, an abiding faith, a walk with him. And I want it to be an intimate companionship that I look forward to every day of my life. And so here God begins to give us that opportunity to gain the knowledge that only comes from the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Wow, what a person to listen to. Rather than just saying, hey, I know something about somebody or I know them from a distance. I remember when Don Shula was a coach of the Miami Dolphins and he had his great undefeated season. And, and he went on vacation with his wife after the undefeated season. The only one ever in the history of the NFL. And they went to Maine. And so they went and got him a cabin up there. And they were in a little town. And Don Shula asked his wife, what do you want to do? She said, let's go to a movie. So they went to the little movie theater in that town. And they walked in, Don Shula and his wife, and there's just a few people in the darkness in the theater, and all of a sudden they turned around and everybody started clapping. So Don Shula waved at everybody, coach of the Miami Dolphins. He went and sat down, and there was somebody right in front of him, and the guy turned around and he said, we are so glad you're here. He said, how could you tell that I was Coach Shula in the darkness? Oh, he said, we don't know who you are. They told us that they would not show this movie unless 10 people came. You're number 10, and we're just proud you're here. That's kind of the level of most of our relationships. Paul says, I want to know Jesus Christ in the depth of his being. I want to experience him every day of my life. And I want there to be intimate fellowship between me and the Lord Jesus Christ. So one of your spiritual benefits as a child of God that Paul says, I've, I've reversed my priorities. Used to, I wanted everybody to know who I was. I'm Paul. Uh, and back then he was Saul, the persecutor of the Christian church. 
And he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day. And he was a Pharisee, a a, a strong leader in the teaching of the law. And he says, you know what? All that stuff is like garbage to me now because I have discovered the greatness of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. How important is salvation to a soul? And how beautiful is a loving relationship that you get to be a part of every day of your life. Second spiritual benefit that kind of gives us our purpose in life as I know Christ, then I realize that I am right in this world. And so he says in verse 9, if you'll read verse 9 with me, it says this, and be found in him not having, not having a righteousness of my own. Our self-righteousness is like filthy rags in the presence of a holy God. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here, what Paul is teaching us about this righteousness in Christ is it comes from God and it's on the basis of faith. And this is something that Paul had desired all of his life, even as a Pharisee. I want to be right with God. And so how much do I have to do to be right with God? What are the things that I don't need to be doing to be right with God? And so it's a balance of your good deeds and your works. It's called work salvation, and it's no good in the presence of a holy God. Your salvation was paid for by the royal precious blood of his only son, Jesus Christ, and it's only through that blood that you're made righteous and right with God. And so it's where God begins to reveal to Paul all these things that you've searched for, they've left you empty. You've been longing to be right with me to the point of a zeal to where you'd kill other people that oppose the law of Judaism. And, And all of this is because there's an emptiness in your soul and he would cry out and even after he became a follower of Jesus Christ over in Romans chapter 7 verse 24, you remember what Paul said? It's what I say sometimes in my prayer life. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me? from this death of this physical body. Who's going to set me free? And what happened in Paul's life? He met Jesus on the road to Damascus as a persecutor. He left Damascus as a preacher and proclaimer of the greatness of the Lord that he now knows. God turned the light on. He gave him the desires of his heart and allowing him to come to know him personally. And, and then he says, and because of that, I stand in the righteousness of who? Of the Lord. My righteousness is in him because I know him. And so it said best, I think, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, he made him who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, to become sin on our behalf so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Now, you know what I pray for you, and I want to encourage you? I want to encourage you to become the righteousness of God, to do what is right in the eyes of God. And and, and what I want you to realize is it's not a position that you hold. I am righteous. And it's not a status that you share with others. No, it is a lifestyle of activity led by the Holy Spirit of God that allows you to do right things every day of your life that reveal the righteousness of God. Now, what are those right things? Being good to people. We do a thing called house worship. And since Neil's not here today, I'll talk about him. We went to a lady's house the other side of Pedal. Her name is Donna Butler. Her and her husband moved back here a few years ago. They owned a restaurant south of Tucson, Arizona. And she came back and her husband passed away and I did her husband's funeral. She had a a granddaughter and a daughter that used to come to church here, and they called me one day and said, listen, uh, our mother and our grandmother, is she's very lonely. Brother Cliff, is there any way you could go by? Well, I've been visiting her, and I took Neil. I take some musicians with me, and we do house worship. And so the musicians play a song or two, and then I share, and I know you can't believe this, but I do it. I share an eight to ten minute message. All of y'all say, Brother Cliff, you've never shared less than 30 minutes in your life, much less 40. And so I do a short message, and then we pray with that person. And Miss Donna is is an amputee. She's got one leg. She's 82 years old. She's sitting in there, and so I go to the back door, knock on the door, open the door. She has a chocolate lab named Bailey. And when you first walk in that door, you think Bailey is the most fierce attack dog. (laughs) Just gets up in your face and barks. And then you'll hear Miss Donna's soft voice. Bailey, be quiet. 
she'll go in there and sit by Miss Donna. So I told Neil, prepare yourself. We're going to, it's going to look like we're going to be attacked when we walk through this door. And we walk through the door, and here comes Bailey, and then Bailey settles down, and Neil's carrying his guitar, and I'm carrying a big meal in my Bible. And we get in, and we clear that area, that foyer coming in the back of the house, and there's two bigger labs, a white one and a yellow one, and they look like they mean business. They're coming after both of us. I had to go out to the truck and get Neil out of the truck and get him to come back. We're here to have worship with this lady. Not really, but he was heading for the door, and if he didn't get out of the way, I was fixing to run over him. And their name is Jake and Mel, and they're huge. And so I stood there, good dog, good dog, good dog. Please don't eat us. You know, we're com we've come in to do something right, something good. And so it was so funny. She finally called them. They go, and we sit down, and we have house worship with an amputee, three dogs, and sweet lady cat. And when we started my message, the cat left. No, no, they're not interested in the worship service. And so what is God calling you to do? I want you to do what's right. I want you to live an activity lifestyle that says everything that I'm active doing is right in the eyes of God. And it's good, and it's nice, and it's pure, and it's excellent, and it's praiseworthy, and it's beautiful, and it's lovely. It's kind of like the scripture I shared with this lady, Mark 14, in the house worship. It's about the lady who anoints the body of the Lord Jesus Christ with this very precious perfume that cost a year's wages. What did Jesus say? She poured it on him because she loved him. And the disciples began to complain. Hey, you, you waste, that was very expensive what you just wasted. And Jesus said, leave her alone for she has done a good work unto me. She's come before the time for my burial and anointed my body for the burying. And, and the word that is used there is agathos. Agathos means to be uh, morally good. This was a good thing that you did. But then it's also got the word, the Greek word kalos, which means lovely and beautiful. What this lady has done is right in the eyes of God. And it is so beautiful and so lovely that you cannot help but notice the effects of what's being accomplished here. And so what God wants you to do in your lifestyle, every day of your life, I want to live a lifestyle of things that are beautiful and lovely and good that reveal the righteousness and the fact that I have knowledge and I know personally the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Now, the purpose of the ungodly, if you read Revelation chapter 17, verse 13, it'll say their purpose is they're against the Lamb of God. They're anti-Christ all the way. And they're going to be destroyed. And, and Revelation said, don't worry about them. They're going to be done away with. But what is the purpose of those of us who are godly? It is to do what is right in the eyes of God on a continual, daily, consistent basis. This past uh, Wednesday, I don't need to tell you this, Clay's gone on vacation. He's our maintenance man here, our custodian man here, but he's more than that. He's a great minister of God. And he was in my office. He came in Tuesday morning. He said, Brother Cliff, I, we're leaving, you know, Saturday. Me and my family are going on vacation. I got a lot of things to do. So if you don't see me, I'm going to be busy around here. And I got to get this grass mowed. And this grass is growing like crazy. Yes, when it rains and it's 92 degrees and humidity is 94%, grass grows quickly. And so he said, I got a lot of grass to mow and I've got these things to do. I've got some people to ask me to put some stuff up in some classrooms. So I, I'm just going to be, I said, I'll tell you what let's do. This was Tuesday morning. Come in here with me. Let's get right down here on our knees and let's pray that God will give you the ability to get everything done you need to get done. And then when it comes time for you and your family to load up and head for the beach, you'll have a great time on the beach. We prayed that. Let me tell you what happened on Wednesday. He's out here mowing all of these massive acres of Hattiesburg Community Church. He's fixing to mow, and he came, comes to my mind. He said, look, I'm going to be on the mower. If you need me, I'm going to be outside for about, you know, six, seven hours. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there responding to emails. I'm doing some study. I'm writing some stuff, and the mower comes right by my office over here. I come over here to go to the restroom, the men's restroom, and there's a mower out over here. And then I walk back through the front hallway where you set out the glasses, and there's a mower out there. I said, man, Clay must have some kind of energy drink. He's everywhere. He's mowing 100 miles an hour. But you know what? That wasn't the case. There was two guys, one chief of police at Sumrall, one supervising deputy of Lamar County Sheriff's Department. They brought their mowers on that particular day, and they said, Clay, we've come up here to help you mow this place. 
Now you tell me God doesn't hear our heart's desires as we know him experientially, as we have intimate communion with him. And so what I thought was one person mowing 100 miles an hour was three guys. And when I went out for lunch, and one of those guys, and I, I can't tell you their name or they'll lose their reward, uh, Josh Gandy and Dean Stevens is who it was. I cannot keep secrets. And I go out here, and, and I, I walked over to Josh, and his son Connor's with him. I said, man, can I tell you something? You have blessed me today. And Dean had already loaded his more up and left. They mowed all of this acreage in two hours and eight minutes, what usually takes six to seven hours to do. And so, you know, I'm just sitting there, what a blessing. What a blessing in life. And then I sent, when I got up, I, my grandson spent the night with us Wednesday night, and I sleep with a middle one, and I can take it till about 3 a.m. in the morning. He'll punch you, he'll kick you, he'll hold your face, and you just you gotta be prepared when he sleeps in a bed with you. And so about 3 o'clock, I said, I've had enough. I get up, I study the Word of God, I begin to do my prayer time, and after I get through my prayer time, I said, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm gonna send some encouraging text. And I'm going to send one to Josh and Dean for helping us. They really blessed me. I wanted to tell them what they did really touched my heart. That's the, that's the heart of a servant of God, doing what is right in the eyes of God. And uh, I had talked with Josh, you know, previously, and he said, Brother Cliff, I want to do more for the kingdom of God. Now, no, I'm not texting anybody. I am going to look for a text here this morning and see if I can find him this morning. And uh, is Josh going to, oh, he's sitting here. I could talk about him freely last night. I, I can't talk about him freely today, but I am anyway. And uh, they're, they're in law enforcement. And you know, in law enforcement, that's a tough position to be in in our country today. And so uh, I sent those encouraging texts. I got this back from an anonymous person who's sitting to my right. The other anonymous person was on the back row last night. He said, Brother Cliff, if I get to heaven and I lose my reward because of you, I'm going to jerk one of your wings off your back. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, I told him, I'm not going to have wings. I'm just going to try to get in there. I'm like y'all. I'm, I'm holding on for the resurrection that is coming. This came Tuesday, June the 1st, 3.13 p.m. I came scary close to getting to meet God. Thankfully, he wasn't ready for me to join him and yet allowed me to stick around and watch my kids grow up. This is what happens sometimes in law enforcement when bad things happen in life. That was a wake-up call for me that he kept me around for a reason, and I feel like it's time for me to do more than just attend church. So I've prayed about what ways I can help and, and how I can do more for our church, and obviously, I'm willing to be available for security needs within the church, but I felt like I needed to do more than just that. And me and Dean have both been trying to figure out ways that we could be better servants unto the Lord. And so we're wanting to help out in areas that we can benefit the church and its members and thank you for your prayers. What a powerful message. Now, Josh, I didn't need your permission to share that. Your mother sent me a text this morning from Georgia where you've got an uncle that's on the point of death, at the point of death. And she said, my husband said, you need to listen to the worship last night. And I shared that story last night. And she said, I was so thankful you shared that about my son. That's my son. And so I don't need your permission. I have your mama's permission this morning to share that today. And so what, what is God telling us? There's two guys that are just getting together. that are just like you in normal everyday life. Lord, what, what is my lifestyle of activity that shows how wonderful you are, how good you are, how beautiful, how lovely and what could you do? What could be your lifestyle this week that would reveal the righteousness of God that's in him but is flowing through your life because of your intimate companionship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we got to let you out for lunch. It's about time. So let's go to the last benefit. And the last benefit is fellowship. And fellowship is a beautiful thing. And you'll find it in verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Not just the power that brings people from the dead, but he said, I want to know him in the power of the resurrection and the fellowship in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, what he's saying is, I want a fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, okay, Brother Cliff, what does that mean? That's the word koinonia, and this is the meaning of koinonia, a working partnership, a working partnership. An agreement between persons or parties committed to a common task. And what is, what is God's task? The redemption of mankind. 
the blessings of those who come to know him and using them for his glory. The Westminster Confession of Faith, if you look that up, that goes back to the early 1600s where many of the evangelical churches says, what is it that we believe? The Westminster Confession of Faith says, what is the purpose of man? What's your purpose today? Let me tell you the short sentence that's there, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever in the journey of life. And so how do I do that? I do that in fellowship with him. And Paul, who better than Paul could say, hey, I'm willing to join him in his sufferings. Did Jesus suffer? Yes, he did. Did he pay the ultimate sacrifice price? Yes, he did. Would Paul do the same thing? Yes, he would. Now, I don't have time to read this to you, but you can go and read them for yourself. But when you talk about the, the physical sufferings, you read this afternoon, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. This is where Paul says, hey, I've been beaten five times with 39 lashes. I've been beaten with rods. I've been shipwrecked three times. I have spent a full day and a full night treading water in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean. I know what it is to be without. I know what it is to be in danger from bandits, from my countrymen, from the Jews. I know what it is to be in danger in cities and out in the country. I know what it is to go without. I know what it is to be thirsty. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to not have food. I know all of these things. I can relate to the Lord Jesus Christ in my fellowship as a servant that there are physical challenges and sufferings in our life. And some of you may be going through some physical suffering. And then if you go over to Romans chapter 9 and read verses 2 and 3, he speaks about the spiritual anguish that the Lord Jesus Christ went through in his soul. Remember in Gethsemane, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, paralupus. I'm surrounded by sorrow to the point that it's crushing the life out of me. And where was it? Gethsemane. Gethsemane. The place where the olives were crushed to get the pure olive oil out of them. That's where Jesus said, my life is being crushed to bring forth the good that God has planned for people that love him. That's the salvation of your soul through the sacrifice of his life. And so Paul says, I understand physical challenges. I understand spiritual anguish in your soul. I have that in my life for the people of Israel. I have wept for them. I have mourned for them. I desire for them to come to know Jesus Christ. But then he says this, but also I understand the fellowship of sufferings and trials, but I also understand that I want to also be a part of the power of the resurrection. Did you know that God has resurrection power? Do you know that power can be real in your life? Do you know that he can do things that you never dreamed he could do? Now, this is, this is where uh, Martha, Martha, we have a Martha, Martha, and she's sitting right here. And she's just like the Martha, Martha in the Bible. And Martha, Martha came to Jesus when Mary, her sister, was sitting at the feet of Jesus, soaking in every word he was saying. And Martha was working in the kitchen. And she came to Jesus and stood in front of everybody. Do you not care that I'm working that kitchen all by myself? And my sister ought to be helping me, and she's in here soaking in the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, every word you're saying. And here's what Jesus said, Martha, Martha. Well, that's the way our Martha is. She calls me, and I have to slow her down. Slow down. Let me understand what you're <laughs> Martha, 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 Martha. Settle down. Now, what did Jesus say to Martha when she came to him weeping because her brother Lazarus had died? And she meets him. And you, you'll find these words in John chapter 11, 25, 26. Jesus said to her, Martha, 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 Martha. Hold on. I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me shall live even if he or she dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Show me some resurrection power. How about that stone in front of the tomb? Who rolled that away? The resurrection power of a living God. Who caused the earth to shake under people's feet? On that day that he was crucified and that day that he was erected. And listen, maybe God needs to shake your world a little bit where he turns your attention unto him. 
resurrection power. How many miracles did God do through his son Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry? How many people were healed? How many people were raised from the dead? And all of a sudden, Paul says, you know what? Humbly, I want to be a part of that fellowship, of the power of an almighty God. And we live in a world, and don't let me offend you, of weaklings that are afraid to say what truth is, absolute truth. They're afraid to stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, I'm going with him all the way. And this church may empty you say, Brother Cliff, you're not politically, politically correct. Praise the Lord, I am not politically correct. And I'm not trusting the world to bring forth the consummation of the hope of humanity. My trust is in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anything right about my life, it's in him. If anything good is going to happen, it is in my fellowship, my partnership, my covenant with a holy God that's doing awesome things in the midst. And there's hope for every soul that's in this place today. Whatever you're going through, God has the answer. He has a solution for what you're seeking in your life. And you know this? He loves you. With that unfailing love we talked about last week. And so, God, what, what, are you, what are you telling me today? What are the benefits of my fellowship with you? Well, let me list a few, and we've got to close. He says, here it is. It's the purpose of your life. Philippians, all contained in this little letter of joy to the church of Philippi. Philippians 3.14, I press on toward the goal. That's my purpose for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm headed heavenward. This earth is not my home. I don't need to get hung up in all the things of this earth. I need to be hung up on the things that are to come that are eternal, that shall last forever, time without end. That's my purpose. What about my praise? In Philippians 4, 4, in this particular letter, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, I hate to keep you a few minutes late, but I'm going to have to tell you this story. We've had a lot of visitors come into our house this summer people that are friends that we know and we love and some that were here a few weeks ago that wanted to come to church with us on saturday night but didn't get to was one of our doctors from our mission team to nicaragua his name is bodo and kathy troy is his wife they live in omaha nebraska so they couldn't get here for a worship service but they came and had a meal with us on a saturday at lunch and and if he had a got to come to the worship service I had looked up on Facebook something his wife had sent, and it was one of his last mission trips before COVID to the Sudan in Africa. He told me that's one of the worst places in the world. There is so much corruption, so many things that are wrong, so many people that are dying. And so he and some doctors without borders went into there, rode in a pickup truck for about eight hours one day in the back of that pickup, got to a little village where they were told you'll probably minister to about three to 500 people. They saw 3,000 to 5,000 people in that village. They gave away their own personal food for people that were starving to death. They, they did everything they could medically, and then when they came out of there on the day that they were to leave, the villages all gathered around them in the Sudan. And they started to do the African things that the African people do. They started dancing and yelling and shouting. And the ladies are standing out there and you just see them, they're dancing like they have no reservations whatsoever. And Bodo is about the most uncoordinated person there is. And his wife was filming this and some of those ladies come over and take Dr. Troy's hand. They pull him out into the circle and he gets out there in that dust, <laughs> kicking up that dust, dancing. And my point, if he'd have got to come the night he was coming in June, the third Sunday of June, if he'd have got to come, my middle point was rejoicing in the Lord. And I was going to put that on that screen with him sitting right here in this worship service. And some of you need to find your joy. You need to put a smile on your face, love in your heart. Hey, you know the one who holds the world in his hand. You've been made righteous in him. He wants to share with you. You're part of the fellowship. And so you have a purpose in your life and you have a praise in your life. I'll rejoice and I'll say it again. I'll rejoice in him ever more. Where does my peace come from? How many of you need some peace? How many of you need relief from stress and discouragement in your life? Philippians 4.11, I have learned to be content whatever my circumstances may be, Paul said. 
What, where does my power come from? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Where do my provisions come from? Philippians 4.19, my, my wife's favorite verse. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in who? Christ Jesus. Quit looking for the world to give you the answer of your life. And don't sell your soul to the world. I remember my son, who was a good athlete, who, who had different college opportunities to play football, baseball, and soccer. He chose soccer. But I remember when he was little, my daughter was a cheerleader, and she was going to a gymnastics class. And he wanted to take gymnastics. So we go in there, and he could do anything. He could turn 50 backwards flips on a trampoline. Uh, he, he was just very, very agile. And so the gymnastics teacher sees him over there cutting up, doing all the stuff, and he comes to my wife and said, we, we want this little boy on our gymnastics team. Now, he's a little bitty guy. And my wife said, well, we, no, we didn't bring him. We brought our daughter here. And so she said, well, you know, we're da our daughter's the one taking gymnastics, not our son. We want him on our team. And said, listen, if you give us him six days a week and we'll be gone every weekend, we'll make a gymnast out of him. And my wife laughed. She said, six days a week, and every weekend be gone. And she said, can I tell you something? Do I need to go get my husband out of the car? He's a pastor, and I'm going to go ahead and give you his answer. The answer is no. We're not selling our child to the world. Nothing is more important than us than what? Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Walking in his righteousness, doing right things as his Holy Spirit guides us daily to do right things and knowing that I'm in a partnership with the one who will live forever when gymnastics and ball and athletics and arts and everything else that we love, and there's nothing wrong with those if you have a balance in your life, but God is supreme in your soul. You're one of his children. Start to live like Paul says we should live because these are the benefits of your life. We had friends, talking about friends, we had Tim Hemis, old Dr. Hemis who teaches at Texas A&M and Colleen, he came and stayed with us. And then we've got missionaries, Ralph and Pilar Gray, my son-in-law's parents who are here on furlough from Baja, California and Ensenada, Mexico. They're here. We took them out to eat yesterday. They're going to eat lunch with us today. And then we've got Bill and Peg Pearson trying to come in and do breakfast with us next Saturday. We've got Jerry and Mimi Barrett. Jerry used to coach down at Lumberton. They live in Senatobia. He's on the board of directors for Northwest Community College. They're meeting on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. They usually come and worship with us. And so she called, Mimi called and said, hey, is Cliff going to be preaching? No, he's not next week. Ray is. And that'll be better for them that Ray is preaching. But they're coming in. How about, how about Saturday lunch? We're lined up until, until August is over with, with friends. And then I got Mike and Cheryl Hurt here today. I got friends. And on Wednesday night, Wednesday night, I'm standing back there by that welcome table. And two people walk by me and the guy bumps me in the arm. And they walk by and they come and sit down right here where Craig and Judy are sitting. And who was it? It was Ronnie and Renee Rigney from Popperville, Mississippi. They were in the church I served 36 years ago. They were some of our best friends. He, he's an engineer for NASA. Been working on the Ares rocket engine all of his life. It's being used right now today. Renee is retired as a school teacher. Ronnie's going to retire. He's a consultant with NASA now. He'll retire in December. They walked right past me. And, and I told everybody at the end of prayer meeting, I said, boy, we are good friends. We used to vacation together. I said, we are good friends. They didn't even recognize me or speak to me when they came in. That's how tight we were. And so there's friends and there's people coming through. And so in my sending text at 434 on Thursday morning to Josh and Dean and everybody else I could think of to encourage, that doesn't mean you have to read my text when I send it. But when you get up, read it because I don't send text. And so I, I sent a text to them and I got a text back and here's basically what it says. We enjoyed so much the sweetness of the fellowship in Wednesday Worship Church at Hattiesburg Community Church. There's something special about that place. Now, that's real, my soul. And then they said this. They've got a camp up here on the Leaf River where my son's fixing to move up in Moselle. Then they said, and we are looking forward. We're almost to the point where we're going to have some time and we cannot wait to come to Hattiesburg Community Church and soak up all the things that God wants to share with his people. 
Listen, do you come to church that way? Lord, I'm here to soak it up. Speak to me. Let me know. Tuesday, house worship. Chuck tells me, he said, hey, what, what time are you going to do house worship? I said, right at 1 o'clock. Well, I've invited somebody to come by here that I want to pray with at 1245 to 1. So when you come back by the church, I was meeting some people for lunch. When you come back by, I want you to pray with us. Who was that person? It was Mark Wing. Mark Wing, bless his heart. He's been through it, and he's here in church today. And, and I said, we prayed that God would help him discover what's wrong. Well, I'll tell you what's wrong. Four kidney stones in the left side with one major big stone in the bladder that's got to be removed this week. And so he's just been in continual pain. And we got over here. It was Neil Poe, myself, and Chuck. And we laid hands on Mark, and we began to pray for him that God would give him relief. Let me tell you this text that came from Mark Wing. Came back after Thursday morning. Good morning, Brother Cliff. I want to thank you for praying over me yesterday. And there was something about that prayer. You you ever sense just the power of the presence of the Lord? There's just something about that power. And and he says this, I want to thank you for praying over me yesterday. I, I actually woke up this morning with no pain and no nausea. Praise God. And so he's in the process of getting things straightened out in his life. And what's he doing in the midst of the pain? He's trusting God. And God is ready to meet with us anywhere, anytime, any place to do anything that God desires to do as we continue to glorify his name and enjoy him forever. Lord, would you help me be like Paul and say what used to be important is not important? And what used to not be important is very important. I want to know you. I want to be right through you. I want to fellowship with you forever. And I want to fellowship with other brothers and sisters in the Lord as we carry out the work of the kingdom of God. May his benefit fall upon you today. And may your life soak them in. And may he lead you to live a lifestyle of activity that reveals the goodness and the beauty and how lovely our God is as he relates to you his creation. Would you bow with me? We're a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you today and we're like the Apostle Paul. Sometimes our life is empty and Lord, the only way it's going to be full of things is going to be filled with the riches of God. Sometimes we feel like we have no hope, but God, Paul discovered his future was bright because of the promises of God. Sometimes we're like Paul, we feel spiritually bankrupt, but God, you make us spiritual millionaires. And we're going to live forever on the streets of gold. Lord Jesus, take charge of my life. Rearrange my priorities. Restructure my ledger. And the bottom line today is don't ever let me be the same again. My true wealth, our true wealth is in you. In the immortal words of Jim Elliott, a missionary that was martyred at the hands of the Aku Indians in Ecuador, He said these words, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Lord, with you, we cannot lose. Speak to our hearts. If there's someone here today that needs to know you in a personal relationship, let the Holy Spirit call them. Let us pray with them as they confess their sin and repent of their sin and receive you as their Lord and Savior. If there's people looking for a place to say, I want a spiritual family and I want to be active in doing the right things of God, Lord, you may lead them here. You can join by two ways, statement of your faith that you already know the Lord Jesus Christ or profession of your faith that you want to know him. And we love to baptize you and give glory to him because of the change that's taken place in your life. Lord, there's people here that are going through struggles and situations and challenges in their life. God, open the windows of heaven. Reach down with your loving arms and strengthen them. Bring some of that resurrection power and lift up their spirits. And Lord, let your will be accomplished today in this time of responding to you. There's people we need to pray for, Lord. Allow our prayer warriors to come and kneel in your presence and just lift people up. You may want to come and kneel and just say, Lord, here I am. Speak to me. Communicate with me. I want to know you, Lord, as I've never known you before. And I want to praise you for all of the benefits and the blessings in my life. 
God, let your spirit move and let your glory be revealed. Let our lives be changed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we humbly pray. Amen. Would you